Hi, this is David again from Anarchapoco 2020, and I'm here with Tom, who I met yesterday. Hello. He's going to give you a little bit of his background, and then we're going to talk about um, banking and community and money. Okay. Yeah. So, my name is Tom, and it's my first time uh, at Anarchapulco. And, and I was attracted to this event mostly because of um, listening to Ron Paul um, for many years, uh, and he has been a, a big advocate of uh, decentralizing uh, money and ending the Federal Reserve. Um, which always kind of uh, rang true and, and uh, as, a, as, a, as a sensible thing to do because I believe in mostly decentralization and, and centralizing anything is uh, usually a very bad idea. You, you have some background in government. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 when I graduated, um, I wanted to do some <laughs> good, I guess. Uh, uh, and I did economics, which is another topic, but <laughs> uh, but I did economics, uh, and I was quite interested in um, well, eco economy, like how, how stuff moves, works, and uh, etc. Uh, and I got into uh, a chartered accountancy um, training, which in the UK is a, a, a big thing, which is usually sponsored by. Uh, they call the big four, the PricewaterhouseCoopers, KPMG, Deloitte, Ernst & Young, or small accounting firms. But the program I got onto was at the National Audit Office, which is the, uh, an independent watchdog in the UK, which works on behalf of the parliament to scrutinize the government. So it's the MPs and then the whole of the, gov uh, the parliament and the elected people that use this um, watchdog to scrutinize uh, the government spending in terms of audit so that everything uh, adds up and the second branch of that office is uh, value for money studies so they produce reports which evaluate the government uh, uh, programs, initiatives, departments in terms of how well they perform for the resources that they appropriate mm -hmm. um, using different methodologies, etc. So on that team actually I was involved, I got into working with uh, the team called uh, uh, private sector team. So uh, there was a, this big ideological drive in the UK from 1980s, basically up to when I was working there as well, and the private sector is always better. So they had those massive, they were called PFI schemes private finance initiative. Okay. This is where you arm a contract and instead of the government building infrastructure, you, you give it to private contractors, which now, you, I don't know if you follow financial news, now they all get going bankrupt. Carillion, Capita, uh, they all went bankrupt because uh, <laughs> they got all that money, they siphoned it offshore, they got uh, debt, uh, they borrowed a lot of money because they said, oh, we're going to get so much money from the government. So the banks lent them uh, like crazy uh, and, and, and then now they're going bankrupt. So the services are being cut and, uh, uh, and a lot of people are losing their jobs. And on the other hand, um, it never worked that well, although my report says it was a good idea. <laughs> okay, it be may be better than the alternative, but still... No, 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 I mean... Because there was a big outrage in the UK at the time, that's why we did the report, because of the excessive returns that the investors in those schemes were getting. From government contract work. From government contract yeah. works, yeah. etc. So I, I looked at it and it was like, I mean, what is excessive? I mean, uh, is 5% excessive a year? Is 2% excessive a year? Is 3% excessive a year? Yeah. The thing was that there were these early stage guys that were getting like 20-30% return on the money and, and people were like how is it possible that they make 30% of return on a hospital right and and the reason was those guys were early so they did all the infrastructure and then they sold off the project uh, to some other guys when it was already operational gotcha. so the, the way that they made money was the project the whole project was uh, done by five percent annually that was their cut five percent annually but if they did everything and then they managed to sell it off to somebody who would accept three percent annually then those 20 years it's a lot of money 
Uh, so that, that money, two percent differential every. The two percent differential for goes to those guys who sell it yeah. to somebody who's willing to accept three. So right. that's why they make thirty. Right. If they stayed with it, they would have made five. So it became a trading scheme rather than a means of building infrastructure, sort of. A little bit of a trading scheme, but the, the, what I'm trying to say is that the, 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 the returns weren't excessive when you painted it like that because oh, sure. it was 2 just five percent. Yeah. 5%. 5%, 5 total, yeah, and, total were... and then those guys extracted those two from the rest of the contract and sold to somebody who was willing to accept the three. Sure, sure. Anyway. So in the end, in the end, it was like fine, but it, it, it wasn't fine. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, all those, a, a, lot of a lot of public money was probably siphoned offshore. A lot of those guys got so much debt, the management extracted so much wealth like, of those, from those companies, I bet, through the options and, and, and stock uh, awards or whatever. Right. And at the end, the services are not better. I mean, I, I don't think that that that, that, that might, the, so the value, the value the, for money wasn't any wasn't improved. I don't think so. Sure. But that was our like that was the government uh, idea of that's how we're going to. So do you stuff. were you were involved in this, and then how did you come to? You talked about Ron Paul, and then oh, one, I always one, I always had those like libertarian and decentralization tendencies. Okay, uh, but it was like just like I don't know driving your car and just putting on a podcast with right it wasn't uh, yeah it, it wasn't was oh these guys like, like around, what he's yeah. saying uh, sure. it makes sense etc listen to i don't know i'm chomsky ron paul like people who like were kind of anti-war anti-interventionist and uh, a little bit decentralization etc so yeah uh, and, and then in, in that government job i also had a chance to uh, do the un and uh, uh, like uh, Consulting and, and about evaluating UN because UK was at the uh, at the five years at the UN Board of Audit. Okay, uh, at a seat like a rotating seat. So I was part of the team and uh, did the UN audits and and as well uh, value for money studies. What did that look like? What was your experience with that? I mean, it's just uh, it, no matter what you write in the report. I mean, it just doesn't ma matter. Uh, uh, it's a it's a huge bureaucracy. Um, it was just quite. We went to the operation in um, Jordan, which was set up for the Syrian refugees, which were flooding, flooding there. And, and I mean, there's so many people, great people there, that just want to so much good. And I think the whole like bureaucracy is just uh, making it almost um, it's not impossible because they still do it, but yep. just so much more difficult than it should be. Right. And at the end of the day, the objective isn't what they state there is. Uh, what they state the objective is. It's like World Bank. They state the objective is reducing world poverty. Sure. <laughs> and then they well, issue all these loans. And, and then they just, yeah, and they just enslave like all those people with yep. debts that they can't repay. So uh, yep. I, 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 it's the same with the UN. I mean, the stated objective is one and the other one is just uh, pure politics. So, so I, I was quite disgusted by, by that and I thought it was so much like, well, I'm not going to do much, much good here because I'm just going to uh, get frustrated and probably get fired and uh, and and on the other hand I, I, I don't want like be comfortable but like dead I mean dead inside with no kind of uh, yeah um, um, doing something I know is like it's, worthless right uh, it's a moral it's a moral conundrum and there's no meaning in it uh, yeah because yeah. I mean I, I, I don't I, I, I save like I know 80% of the money I make I, I don't need like the, the, the money what I need is like the meaning of like yeah. so, to do something meaningful so I thought okay this won't work plus I also wanted to travel the world so government sort of skills are not very transferable sure because every government is different so after I finished the accountancy training and I got um, the uh, chartered accountant. Uh, I switched to private sector. So I found this company who was in 32 countries. Uh, and it was a very decentralized company. So basically, the headquarters it, it had 20,000 employees. It has, I guess, 20,000 employees, but the headquarters have maybe 50 or, or 20. Okay. So they just buy companies and they let them do whatever they did before. Sure. It's sure. just for the owner to sort of like retire, yep. kind of retire, get the money, and still uh, operate the company. And they they. they they make his life easy and you get to you get to uh, see all those things yes. uh, and, and I had skills so they hired me in uh, internal audit uh, and I went to do some projects in Europe and, uh, and the UK and then I went to Mexico about six months after I started and they needed somebody there uh, for an operational role in finance so they offered me a job and I and I and I stayed uh, okay. and I stayed uh, in Mexico uh, 
working there now for a, for a few years with, with the companies that they acquire, which was quite Locally, a yeah. great experience because those are like really raw entrepreneurs that build the businesses from the ground up. Um, there's a guy in Mexico who started with I don't know, a box of sort of plastic gloves mm -hmm. from his uh, garage. Um, and 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 and, and he's, he got like a multi uh, uh, a multi million dollar um, massively profitable business, uh, sort of hustling and and doing <laughs> sure, sure, doing sure. stuff. Uh, cool. uh, so it was a great experience working with those people. And um, but I always have been very interested in sort of finance and money. And and and, and it's not because it's like would the, the the textbooks are interesting. That, right. that that's why I actually got interested because. You, you realize what they tell you in the textbooks is just like uh, mostly bullshit. I mean, it just doesn't bear any uh, resemblance to, to, to like real life. Like the economic models that they have, um, it's just they assume like there's one agent in the economy who's 100% rational and wants to maximize mm -hmm. his utility, mm -hmm. Homo etc. Homo e economist. Or yeah, whatever, Homo yeah. economicus, yeah. that they yeah, call it, is. which is that that person right. never exists. It's just like completely yeah. unreasonable. And, and the biggest like sort of red flag for me was that they don't consider banks. Like they don't, the banks and the money is never considered in the economic models sure. because they say, they say, oh, one, one debt is another asset, so it all sort of, uh, on the global scale, it sort of nets out, which is, which is, yeah, it does, but it matters who has all the uh, assets and who has all the debts, and, and, and if like you have, I don't know, one person with all the assets and everyone else with all the debts, yeah, globally it cancels, but the economy is like paralyzed because one guy owns everything and the rest are like... Um, Servicing their debt. Or whatever they do, yeah. but they don't. Yeah. They don't have anything yet. So yeah. I mean, it, it, it's just uh, that that won't work, will it? So I mean, you have to look at the uh, at the money and and, and So you, you have this. Uh, you were talking yesterday about banking and community banks and uh, yeah. yeah, community so, needing local banking to to actually work properly, which is why. Yeah. So I, I think I think problem. everyone should um, go and check out Richard Richard Werner and. Um, He's a professor he, uh, of economics, and, and he was an uh, exceptionally bright uh, scholar. Uh, he, he worked then in the financial industry in Japan uh, for many years. So he got a, not only the academic kind of um, background, but also like hands-on. He actually moved massive amounts of money in Japan uh, in, in, within the financial system. And he was there during the, um, during the uh, 19... 87 bubble in Japan and basically he shines the light on like how the whole thing works so he developed uh, a credit disaggregation theory of money which basically is very simple and explains a lot of like crazy stuff uh, that that is going on you, in the economy. Yeah, you said you so, said so, that, so that was said, engineered to bring her out. No, no. I mean, for, first, like the the, the, the the principal idea that his thesis, his econ like academic thesis that he says explain most of the stuff that's going on is this credit disaggregation theory. So okay, he says, okay. credit. You need to not all credit is equal. You need to separate credit and see where it's going. If it's credit and if it's going to productive assets so mm -hmm. building new homes or building new factories it's fine like it usually doesn't cause any trouble and it, it, it does Feels produce it does produce sustainable and good economic growth mm -hmm. and there's credit also for consumption and credit for speculation and all other types of credit which shouldn't be allowed the banks should be banned to create new money in the economy to purchase existing stuff because all they do is bid up the the prices of the stuff. Right. There's nothing new created, nothing gets done, it's a zero-sum game where just the asset prices get bid up. Yep. So for example, he was part, there's this another guy who, call, uh, he was, he's called Lord uh, Turner. Okay. He was the head of the regulator, financial regulator in the UK, he's a grandee of uh, UK establishment and he's also um, campaigning a little bit against that and he wrote a book between debt and the devil uh, and and he there was this statistic that he he said on one of the conferences which was shocking after the 2008 crisis 80 percent i think i, I might getting the number wrong, but something like 80 percent of the, all the new money created 
went into existing property. Okay, right. That's why you see London, it's an unlivable city because all it does, it bids up the property prices and people can't live in it. Yeah. However, it does benefit, well, it benefits speculators, it benefits a lot of people uh, that, that take advantage of like, as well as credit for consumption, which shouldn't exist. People should consume stuff, but you only use existing money that circulates in the economy to do so. Uh, because if you create credit for consumption, some, something gets consumed, but the debt stays, and it's not supported by anything that can collateralize it. Uh, and you just have this hangover from debt. And you have interest, it sort of grows exponentially because of compounding. Right. Uh, so responsible regulators should ban banks from creating credit to um, for existing stuff and 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 um, to be used for productive investment only. E only. So, this so is in Japan, this is thesis, yeah. Right? So in Japan, he, he when he was Jap in Japan, he wrote this book called The Princess of the Yen, okay. which finally beat Harry Potter, I think, in Japan for like twenty weeks or whatever as a number one bestseller, and he explained using obviously his theory and actual like names of people empirical empirical like yeah. empirical he said oh that's a great fact like uh, he's, he says he's the only empirical money economist okay because he is the only person that was allowed to test in a German bank because he's German and he protect he's trying to save the community banks in Germany mm -hmm. so one of the community banks allowed him because nobody else would ever allow you to see how the banking back office and the whole system works because obviously there's these theories that banks don't create money that they just people go to a bank and they deposit money and then they use it to intelligently uh, allocate it uh, in the economy but that's bullshit uh, and he says this is bullshit uh, that that's not how it works what happens is you go to a bank you ask for a loan you give something like uh, your land or whatever as a collateral the bank creates a loan and at the same time it creates a deposit because it deposits a million dollars into your bank account. Yeah. It doesn't come from any other deposits, it doesn't take it from anywhere, it just creates the money out of nothing. Yeah. And he actually went to a bank and, and told them, please show me how I'm going to take a loan now from you for 500,000 euros, could you please give me that loan? Yes we can, here's the loan. Okay, could we, you invite me to your back office and show me where this money which client you took the money from to give that money to me. So he went there and he's, the, he's the, the only person in the whole world that did this test and he proved that the money was conjured out of nothing. Sure. Yep. It, it was just there. Five, it was credited against banks' books and it was just an accounting trick and he yep. got that money. There it is. So that's the purpose, that's the, the very purpose of the bank. So, so, so what he uh, described in that book, Princes of the Yen, mm -hmm is uh, Japanese economy after World War II was occupied by the um, United States. There was a massive occupation and they controlled media, etc. And little by little they gave control back to the Japanese, uh, only, only having control of ministry, a uh, little ministry of propaganda and the central bank. But not explicitly. Sure. But as, as you probably heard, the, the, the policy is always the US, IMF, or whatever policies, the central bank has to be independent. An independent central bank. Like the bank, Federal Reserve is Like the Federal Reserve is independent. Obviously, yeah. they're never independent, but uh, what happens is they don't want the government to have the visibility of the Fed books and what they do. Yep. So that's, that's, that's what happened in Japan. Japan was a basically war economy after World War II. It wasn't an economy like. Americans envisioned the world of sort of uh, free markets uh, and, 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 and free agents uh, doing whatever they want. It was a command and control basically economy which was run extremely well. So they had a central bank and the Ministry of Finance in conjunction. They had a 10-year you know, plan, 15-year plan of how to build up industries that they needed and how to make sure that everyone benefits. Okay. And they. Uh, and they did that by window dressing, it's called in, in banking. Window, I think window dressing, but it's basically when the central banks, there's always a person in every big bank uh, that is a li liaison with the central bank. Yep. So they call the banks and they give them quotas of credit 
how much credit they can allocate in every period of I don't know, a month, three months or whatever and which sectors, they don't tell you which companies, but which sectors you have to give the credit to. So for example, they call I know, Nomura in Japan, they say, this three months you need to create 100, I know, 2 billion US dollars of credit and it needs to go into automotive industry and um, I don't know, fertilizers. So then they create those duopolies, oligopolies within the sectors because that's the only way to have uh, profits basically and avoid like this cutthroat competition for market share when everyone so sort of a, kills. You don't have a monopoly and you don't have 20 people competing for the same thing. Killing yeah. themselves right. uh, and destroying a lot of value through just stupid like uh, copy and paste and and and, and so when you're creating of, credit into an industry, the and it the works so well that Japan control. grew like crazy right. and it grew without inequality. So it was a very kind of equal society, and it was rapidly like it was like in the U.S. There was a big scare that Japanese are going to take over our electronics and and and, and autos, etc. Yeah. So they said, and they they lobbied and lobbied them to change this uh, command and control economy because at the end of the day it's not good either I mean because there's only that much you can grow Toyota yeah uh, especially if you just sell Toyotas to your internal population yeah because how many Japanese are going to drive Toyota so in order to grow it more you need to export and exporting again it's create imbalances between countries so if the country doesn't have anything to send back they get into debt etc so, mm -hmm. so it's not a great uh, dynamic anyway mm -hmm. but they wanted to change it and they realized it worked so well for Japan, nobody's going to want to change it. There's no, there was no buy-in for change from almost any corner of, 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 of Japan. Because yeah, no political support. No political it. support, it no works, popular so support, nothing. Yep. So what they, decided, well, what they did, like everywhere, they said we need to create a crisis because if there's a big, big enough crisis, people are going to say, are they going to agree to whatever measures you propose to solve it? Yep. So what they did was, uh, via central bank, basically, they started inflating a bubble in Japan. So now, the, the bank was calling the banks, and instead of saying, give 100 million to whatever, Toyota, mm -hmm. they say, give crazy amounts of money. It was like, th there were some people that he, Richard Werner, went to those banks and interviewed, then they, all those people got fired, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but because they were not allowed to say those things. But they admitted that it was, uh, it was silly. Like the, the quotas they were getting from central bank to give credit uh, was silly. Uh, and, and they started lending to uh, speculators, prop existing property, stock market, everything went up. It was one of the biggest bubbles ever. I mean, it was a, a piece of land, small piece of land in Japan, uh, in a prime uh, area of Tokyo, which was worth more than the whole state of California at some point. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's how crazy it was. Mm -hmm. Obviously, everyone was ecstatic. Everyone was making more money than uh, the entire generations uh, in just like a week <laughs> yep. or whatever. Yep. Everyone was loving it, uh, but that was engineered. The bubble was engineered, and um, and then and, and then once you restrict credit, it's like a house of cards. Mm -hmm. uh, it all collapses. Because that's another thing that do people don't realize how banking works and how powerful are, are, are the banks. Because imagine, imagine uh, a simple situation where at the beginning of the economy, there's only one bank and one client. The client goes to the bank and he says, I want, please give me a loan of $1 million. They say, what do you have to guarantee that money? He says, I've got this land, I'm going, I want this loan to build a factory. So whatever I build is yours as well. They give him the money, so he goes off and builds it, but the problem is that they give him the million dollars, but they ask for a million dollars and 100,000 or whatever the interest is yep. back. Right. And it's an impossible situation because Where the interest come up? is never Where's created. Yeah, exactly. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? Yep. So there are only three possible uh, solutions to this uh, thing. The guy come, goes back after the period the loan was for, and the bank can do three things, basically. They can uh, collect, which he, there's almost, it's impossible for him to repay. So what they have is his land and whatever he toiled for uh, all those months, uh, and they take it yep. just by conjuring something that never existed. They can roll over the loans so and say, don't worry, come back and next year, and the loan, but the loan grows. The loans the grow, 
that's the thing that loans grow exponentially because yep. of compounding. Yep. If you look at compounding, which Warren Buffett calls the uh, uh, eighth wonder of the world or whatever, uh, it's unbelievable how fast it grows. The curve is like that when you have interest on, on debt. And the third thing, and the third alternative, and it's, that's how the system works, is that the bank doesn't make just one loan to one guy. It makes thousands of loans. So this guy can repay his loan in interest as long as he get, gets somehow, either by selling, stealing or whatever, the money that the bank gave to some other act in the economy. Right. So there's even less money to repay. There's not even now enough money to repay the capital, sure. let alone capital plus interest, because this guy appropriated the uh, capital from the other guys, and that's why he was solvent. Yep. And there's, al there's, al there's also people who not only appropriate this little capital to, to pay the debts, but they appropriate billions of capital, uh, which debilitates the uh, other people that the, the, the ability to pay off debts. And that's what happens always uh, when the banks, because bankers don't want this situation when you have uh, debts and they're building up exponentially because it gets out of control. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. bankers always are deflationary. They, they say we hate deflation, we're scared of deflation, but they're always deflationary because otherwise you blow up the system very fast. Okay. So what they do is, they, start, they, they what happened in Japan in 1987, they flip the switch and now there's no quotas, there's no credit. So now nobody can get credit, even if it's for like something good. And everything collapses and all the people lose all the confidence. People lose so much wealth, like in Japan, the, the suicides skyrocketed. Yeah, just, there's no future. A lot of no people future. regard it as a place where there's people, no future. Yeah, people are just depressed and it just destroys the society. But that's fertile ground for change. And then... This is in 87. When it 87. Yep, and right. then they went in and they neoliberalized neo Japan. Yeah, what do you mean by neoliberalized? Well, that, that's the thing. They, they, they introduced the system of control basically through these private enterprises that you don't have this powerful state that wants to protect uh, the economy. There's no, 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 no backstop uh, there because it's... So it's a, it's a privatization of unbounded credit. Basically, it gives unlimited power to private firms like JP Morgan, I guess, because they sure. have unlimited balance sheets. And it's, sheet. not, it's not community, it's not and private not, in the sense that it's, it's not a community institution. And there's no, yeah, and there's no, because otherwise Japan could stand up to, to themselves sure. because they would control the whole apparatus and they could take the economy wherever they wanted. Oh, we want to be 100% green, we want to just be re, re, renewable. They could do it with the system they had before. Yeah. Now they can't do it because right. the in interest, interest uh, in uh, in a lot of stuff that are like private and, and it's just uh, so much more difficult. I don't know. I mean, who knows which system is better? I think all of them are bad if you have like centralization. That's why what Richard does now is he was exposing this as a sort of, uh, that's where it's going, it's going to total centralization. Centralized, you... centralization of credit, which sort of comes from, um, I mean, that's the central banking with the Federal Reserve and the yeah, European but, Central but Bank. But he says, his theories, it. like, look at is what's happening. Central banks are killing banks. The, the plan of central banks is to kill all the banks. Right. Especially the small banks. So they do it via uh, low interest rates because that kills like banks and if you're small it's even worse and through excessive regulation. So you have those like thousands and thousands of some crazy documents and regulations that don't make much sense but you do have to like tick all the right boxes because otherwise you get shut down and no small community bank when you have just like one banker who does good for communities going to hire like seven expensive lawyers to fill out this crap. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so it's like an impossible situation and now they want to also kill all the banks so that every single citizen has an account with a central bank, there's no cash, um, all digital so it's a total control from like one, one central thing that sees every transaction that goes within one economy. Right, and that's incompatible basically with, with cohesive community. It's co yeah, for, for all exactly, sorts of, because all sorts it's of a reasons. superstructure that relies on some kind of bureaucrats 
and, 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 and empower hungry people. There's no accountability, there's no transparency. So what they don't know the needs of the people in the in the town or whatever. And that's not they even, don't a, even, even care concern. about that's not even a priority. Yeah. Right. And and that's another thing with big banks. The problem with big banks, everyone needs to grow. And that's why uh, like the speculation is so rampant nowadays. If you look at the stock exchange, if you look at the asset prices, it's so rampant because banks need to grow. And if you're a big bank and you have a balance sheet of 150 billion, 200 billion or whatever, you need to grow your balance sheet by, let's say, 50 billion mm -hmm. in order to get 5% growth. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no way you can allocate that 50 billion intelligently into real economy because you would need an army of, of bankers basically interviewing businesses, small enterprises. Tens of thousands of small, Tens of thousands yeah. of small loans would have to be approved and reviewed, which yep. nobody wants to do because it's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's a gargantuan um, it's a undertaking. Of, it's a lot of relationships. So what they do is uh, they get corrupted. So they build those massive companies that shouldn't be any bigger, like uh, Boeing or Coca-Cola, and they have all those, uh, it was proprietary trading before, now it, they rely, it's, it's been banned, but they rely on like satellite sort of hedge funds and money managers. Yep. So what they do is they make loans to those guys because those guys don't ask for like 50,000 to start a, a, I don't know, a bottling operation uh, in a small village of, uh, in Arkansas. They ask that to speculate and they ask for billions. So they cut, I don't know, 100 checks, 50 checks, and they grew. And, and they grew the, profit the And they also grew very profitably because yeah. there's no way that Boeing is ever going to go bankrupt because if it, even if it was bankrupt the paper, the government would bail it out just like they bailed out the GM or whatever. Sure, sure. And the speculators as well. I mean, all the speculation, you can't make money in speculation. And uh, mostly, I mean, either you're lucky or connected, I, I guess. So, yep. I mean, if you make sure that only speculators who are, have the right information get the money, you don't lose your, your, your loans either. And you make that money so much easier than doing actual work. So it's a very perverse incentive just, just by looking at it. And there's also the element of lack of, total lack of transparency and accountability. So, so you end up with some crazy airport somewhere that nobody asked for, nobody wanted, and uh, nobody knows what the purpose of it is, uh, uh, or some kind of, uh, I don't know, some crazy chemical pr plants to process some chemicals for another country in your neighborhood that nobody really wanted. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's get, it, built, it gets built there, and it probably gets built by people in the community taking their time to build something that nobody even wants yeah. or asks for. So, uh, that's a big problem and it creates like monstrosities uh, uh, so what Richard does now instead of exposing it through ac academia which is pretty hopeless I think what he he started doing is he started creating community banks in the UK so he goes to local councils and tries to get uh, and people who are and and Buy into it. Right. Buying into and this is it. like people in the city, the city government, and the people in the town. Yeah, little people yeah. in the town. Yeah. And the biggest concern is like we don't have money to fund this bank. Sure. And he says you Start don't need capital. it because you don't understand banking. You should learn banking, and with like seed, like with this like little capital. You can start making loans and then you can start making money out of the real stuff that's being made out of those loans yeah. and you grow rich without having to put like the capital into the bank every year. You just do it once right. and it and it just sort of uh, starts working by itself. And then obviously locally you will have trans, trans, more transparency, more accountability. So the growth won't be crazy either because if some guy locally, the, the local banker starts speculating with community's money, everyone is going to know he's yeah. doing it and yeah. they're, going to, uh, uh, they're going to sort that guy out. Sure, uh, so, sure. Uh, they'll take care of it. Yeah, they, they'll take care of it. Yeah. Uh, and that's why he says that's why Germany is so powerful because those little banks, they, there's so many community banks which are disappearing at the rate, at, at just a huge rate now. But those banks, they go to those little, the, the middle, small to middle sized enterprises and they, and they lend into real economy. That's why Germany is an economic powerhouse because somebody actually lends to people that don't just buy up properties in prime London because they think it's going to double uh, next year because it already doubled like every year for the next 10 years. 
uh, they, they, they lend it to somebody who wants to make a, a new, I don't know. It's, it's uh, a small, new, medium-sized enterprise. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Innovating and, and, uh, and producing like real goods that people need. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. And it, how, how and it eliminates as well the, 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 the crisis in Germany. There wasn't a bailout of banks for like ages. No bank. Now Deutsche Bank is going to probably be, get I mean, Deutsche Bank was a problem. It, so, for sure. I mean, it was a bailout at the end because they sacrificed Greece and, uh, and they bailed out Deutsche Bank and French banks. But, yeah. but those community banks don't create those systemic issues. So even if one falls, it, I mean, yeah, it's a strategy for this community. But they still can like, because they have support and they... they but they can restart very easily. It's not yeah. like this massive enterprise falling and then people disconnected, people everywhere lose their purpose and, and, and meaning because some kind of a superstructure, God knows where, collapsed because of some uh, degenerate gambling. Yep, yep, with, with other people's money. Yeah. Um, where do you see uh, your involvement in this? Like this is something that you're, you know, you're obviously very into, um, not just academically, you have some experience in it. I mean, I don't know. No, I don't have experience but you have some, in banking, you have some experience, but I have, you have experience in, in I have great interest economics. In it, you have a lot yeah. of interest in it. You worked in government before. You've seen the, you know, you've seen some of the problems of trying to do good on a on a centralized scale. Yeah. Um, so how do you how do you see uh, yourself? You know, over the next ten or twenty years, is it like you going around and, and talking to people about it? Is there anything you're doing personally? Is there any direction that you think you could go in your career that would be meaningful in this way uh, what, what do you think I mean I never expected I would end up where I am now and I didn't plan it out but I mean I just follow my interests and then see how the situation develops and I'm a bit I guess disappointed by sort of lack of awareness and even lack of sort of um, Kind of questioning of stuff that's going on among the general population, so uh, it's it's a little bit hard to uh, um, be an activist when nobody wants to listen to, to you, sure. etc. So, sure. so, and and I thought it wasn't maybe that urgent uh, before. So I said, yeah, I mean, that's an idea, but I mean, if, if, if the big thing works and they sort of reform it and 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 they realize, oh, this is leading to inevitable distraction and some kind of uh, uh, crazy outcome of, of uh, totalitarian government, people will sort of, oh, hold on, let, let's, let, let's not go there. But that but has not happened. It actually goes more and more into this uh, uh, weird place. So, right. um, so now this is the first time I, I came to an Acapulco. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, still, I, I don't know. I don't think like cryptocurrencies and this kind of uh, seasteading and stuff like that, escaping and, and speculating on, on these things is, is, is a solution. I mean, it, it's great that it's waking people up to the problems sure. or, or that exist and like, I think Bitcoin is amazing because it highlights like, people start questioning like, how's money made and and, and, yeah. and, 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 and uh, how, how come this works and, and stuff like that. So this is amazing. Um, but uh, I think what you have to do is just, um, Roll up your sleeves and and, and, and and work in a community, and it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter what your ideology is or, or, or whatever. I mean, who cares? Like if you believe, right. if you read Hayek or you read, uh, it doesn't. Like no, nobody in, in the community will like care about it. Like, uh, I, it's not an issue. It's a non-issue. It's an issue between, I guess, intellectuals and academics who sort of fight over the um, ideology, but. Locally, you do need to put in real work, and I, 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 I would, I guess, I think, maybe I, I would like to get involved into that. So maybe like in terms of learning more about it, and then having some program to, to teach people in the community that are interested. Like this is how you could maybe uh, alleviate some of the issues. For example, now I was listening to these guys complaining about money problems of a lot of people from Anarcopulco who are more active. So they don't maybe work full time, but they want to do activism full time. Yep. They struggle financially. And a lot of them are extremely talented people. They have crazy skills as well. So even within this community, I think there's potential to... Um, I can't remember the name of the place, but I, um, I remember seeing a documentary about a small community in some valley in, in, in northern United States that pulled together the resources, so say anything from uh, 
from agricultural machinery to uh, pickles to uh, knitting uh, hours that were recorded in uh, our bank. Everyone pulled whatever resources they could provide and they already had in hand and against those resources the community money was issued that was backed by those resources. Okay. So if you have sufficiently large community, I know, a thousand people and within those thousand people you have some builders, you have some writers, you have some digital people, you have some doctors, you have some uh, knitting uh, yeah. grannies uh, right. <laughs> or whatever, you could collateralize all that stuff against this community money and encourage exchanges within the community. So, so there could be potentially some people within the community who would never need like external money uh, because they could put in whatever skill they have that wouldn't be sellable on a market for, do for US dollars because no corporation wants to buy it or whatever. Yep. But it would be in demand for in, within the community and obviously you have to encourage that you buy a, a hat from a granny, not, not a burberry. Or, or, or whatever, but you could create people who are totally uh, self, well, I mean, not self sufficient, but uh, inde independent from money of yeah, the US money. Internally dependent internally, within the yeah, community. If they don't yeah. have ma many needs, almost all of the needs could be met with the community as long as they contribute something back. And if the community likes the activism, they wouldn't have to even put in like um, real hours. I mean, yeah. it, it could sort of. Um, Circulate. So yeah. there was this actual. Uh, I think that those kind of people should be as well looked at. And how do you al alleviate? It doesn't have to be an anarcho-pulco community. It could be some kind of uh, underdeveloped region um, sure. and an ex-industrial base in some other place or whatever. It's just sort of uh, encouraging people to trade within themselves and giving transparency of what everyone has and then also collateralizing it against the currency so it doesn't have to be barter it ha it, it can be like yeah, you get that efficiency if you get a, yeah yeah you can you, yeah. you can get a, a slip of paper and you don't have to get something from the guy you you actually gave you can, it can be exchanged from another guy's hours from the from the bank right um, so I think that stuff like that that I think should be really looked at if you want to facilitate uh, real change, like community banks, in order to build up communities. I think you, you mentioned that Amish people. I think yeah, it's an yeah, extreme Amish example. Yeah, yeah, old order Mennonite. Sure, right. They're, but they're they're out there. They're yeah, not. They're, this isn't yeah. just some theoretical thing. Exactly. There are communities yeah. that do this, and they've been around for a long time, and there there are limitations. And, to I, some I, of the ways yeah, they do and it. I think people may yeah. be a little bit. Oh, okay, the Amish they're a bit extreme, but you. I, and I think that's information suppressed, but there are communities I mentioned in the United States that successfully right. introduced yeah. community money. Yeah. And they were normal people, they still bought like Snickers or whatever, yeah. but like 80% of the stuff was I don't know, 50% or whatever percent you have circulating in the economy, it just makes so, things so much better. Yeah. Because you don't... Yeah, it, it, it doesn't disintegrate the community. It doesn't disintegrate, time. everyone has some purpose as well, if you can employ their skills. And it doesn't like you don't extract the wealth from the community to buy paper from another community, for example, United States government. Right. You'd have to pay pay dollar. I mean, you'd have to get dollars. So you need to exchange something to get those dollars. I mean, uh, no, no free free money unless unless you're a banker. Yeah. Uh, but um, those people would have to sacrifice something for in the community to get something that they wanted that they might actually find within the community. So sure. Uh, okay. Those are the kind of uh, things that I think are not only very interesting, but have very tangible effect. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't think you can change anything from top down. You know, it has to be bottom up. It has to be bottom up. So we can talk here all we want. We can create the global Facebook groups and global anarcho movements. So whatever movement you want, it won't change anything if there are no people who are feeling that they can derive meaning and, 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 and feel part of a community that doesn't sort of uh, exploit them. Yeah. Real, real people in real neighborhoods and exactly, real towns exactly. actually doing stuff. Yeah. And there's also links to this problem now we have with social media. People trade off this real human interaction for uh, digital interaction, yeah. but somehow it doesn't satisfy our psychological needs or whatever needs we have, and people end up depressed and people end up uh, alienated and people uh, are in a bad shape. Yeah, uh, Same, similar issue. Just because they don't relate to real people that live next to them, they relate to somebody in uh, other country that shares their ideology, but, but it's so 
difficult to to build something with them without like sharing physical I guess physical space yeah. I mean it's still possible but it just makes it difficult One and more. if your community won't accept it and they and they and they and they part of something else then, then you're not going to win anyway you need to win over your community right. you need to go back to where you're from or where you have roots and, and you need to do it from the bottom up start there start there not not go talking to some president or or, or I, I mean, it's still good. I mean, I love those guys and I feel here at home. And this, I, I spoke with some guys who created their own country in Serbia or whatever, and they go and meet with Vatican and presidents. Yeah, that's fine. Sure. That's fine. But I mean, uh, it's fine to illuminate issues and it's fine to start the conversation. Um, but, but, but it needs to go, you need, you need to go back to, I guess, uh, people that trust you, um, that you can give something back to them and, and rebuild it from the ground up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's very cool. That's a okay. good summation of, of your, uh, of your calling. Great. Your following. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks <laughs> Thank for, you. thanks for yeah, talking. Equally. Yeah. It's a pleasure.